three word thing. Um, yes, good evening all. It's good to see you here. Thank you for coming. Uh, the papers are doing this well by publicising our lectures. This is the third in our series, uh, the, the MacArthur Heritage Lecture Series. This is the third lecture. This is the third year that we have run this series. And uh, thanks to all of you, it's been a booming success. Uh, what do I want to say to you tonight? First of all, I'm going to welcome Rob Close, Professor Rob Close. You still, you're still Professor Rob Close. Associate. Associate Professor. Rob got it, you got to be, get these things right. You got to get these things right, Beth. I, I do, Rob. <laughs> I do, and I'm practicing. Believe me. And Rob is going to talk to. Rob has been associated with the National Parks Association for such a long time, and we are very, very interested. Uh, in the research that Rob has been carrying out into our local Kalala population. If it weren't for Rob, I think the, our knowledge of the local population will be just so much diminished. And now, of course, that population is spreading further afield to uh, Kalo River. And that would be, well, I hope Rob will be able to answer questions for you later on. I'll talk to you later about the next lecture in our series, but just for now, um, it's a pleasure to welcome you, Rob, and say thank you very much indeed. Thanks, Beth. <laughs> Thanks, Beth. Um, a few months ago, our catching team and I were, uh, were trying to, uh, well, our, our aim was to locate one of our radio collared females and take the collar off, but she was living in a place that was very difficult to get to um, by foot. However, there was a track leading back through a private property to almost exactly where this female was. So I thought what I might do is just have a gentle chat to the, um, to the landowner and see whether we could drive down and, uh, and set up our gear there. But the gentleman, was, in fact, was very, very antagonistic. He said, um, no, you can't go down the track. You'll have to climb up that steep cliff. Um, and furthermore, why did you bring koalas to Campbelltown in the first place? <laughs> and why don't you uh, do something really useful with your time, like cure sick children? And uh, I was sort of a bit stunned from this, and, and that, and that um, dear old play on words, ignoranus, um, came quickly to mind. But I, I was thinking more about um, what he said. And to, to have somebody tell you that your last 20 years have been wasted is quite is quite um, off-putting. but So I was thinking about what, what exactly this Kyla work had been done, and while I was doing that, I thought this might be quite interesting to pursue at the, at the talk. And so what I've done over the past few days is to go back through the last 20 years, and I've pulled out a whole lot of um, old newspaper clippings that have sort of charted the course of, of our Kyla studies, and I put them together. It was quite a big quite a big task, 20 years, an hour talk, that's three minutes a year, it's not very much to do with. But anyway, I've done so, I don't know whether it's going to work out. It's a bit self-indulgent, but I'm getting to that sort of age where you can be self-indulgent. Um, and so hence this first photograph here. I'm, I'm known quite widely around Campbelltown as the, as the koala man, but in my youth I was known as the coot kid. And uh, this is... Uh, me doing, doing my PhD studies at, Mac at Macquarie University with a short-nosed bandicoot in hand. Bandicoots are beautiful animals. And, uh, and this little fellow here is, is one of the ones that I was working with. It's the, uh, the barred bandicoot from, the, from uh, Victoria. It's now, unfortunately, only found in the Hamilton tip alive um, in, in, in nature. But it is a very beautiful little thing. Um, so after I'd finished my PhD, studies on bandicoots, I then uh, started working with rock wallabies for many years. And these are, are beautiful animals too. Whoops, going the wrong way. And wh what you're seeing here is uh, uh, a species of rock wallaby that Jerry and I discovered, actually. We, in fact, we discovered four species of, of rock wallaby. We were setting out, in fact, to reduce the number, we thought, of known rock wallabies from 15 to about 10, but in fact, we added four more to the list. And this beautiful animal is the, pos the proserpine rock wallaby, Petrogal um, Persephone. And I have the dubious honour of, of having one of its stomach 
worms named after me, heterostrongulus closei. Um, but anyway, I'm giving all this background just so that you know that when I came to Campbelltown in 1987, I was still working on the rock wallabies. Koalas were the farthest things from my, from my, my, uh, my mind. And I knew almost nothing about them. I knew about marsupials in general and how to handle animals and what's, whatever. But the actual koalas themselves, I didn't know very much about. And um, so, of course, I came in the midst of the, of the Wedderburn, uh, Yap Yan Pin um, chaos that was running. And it was very difficult to, uh, for an outsider to actually work out what was happening. There was so many funny things were occurring. For example, uh, Tim Moore, the environment minister at this stage, uh, after the first response to the Yap Yan Pin development, um, he slapped a, an interim protection order on the site and said, no, we've got to look after the, uh, these, these koalas and the, and the wildlife. And then um, a week later, he was knuckled to change his, inter, his protection interim order. Um, and it just got quite farcical. But in, during that period, one of my undergraduate students had, had written an essay for me on, uh, on the koala situation. And, um, and this is his conclusion, concluding paragraph which was quite amazing. And, um, and I was thinking about this, I think, well, I don't know anything about koalas, but at least I'm a mammalogist, and there's an awful lot of information that is not known, clearly. Um, perhaps I should throw my hat in the, in the ring and, um, and just see if I can, I can find out what's happening with these koalas. Anyway, that's, that concluding paragraph is, is, I think, very good and, and still stands today when you think that's 20 years ago. We're still saying the same things. That is, you've got to have in your environmental studies before you uh, allow any things to go ahead. Anyway, back back at the uh, back at the ranch, Tim Moore's now. This is a couple of weeks later than the last one. Now he's suggesting we catch the entire colony and move it. Um, I don't know where he was going to thinking of he was going to move it, but uh, it just gives you an idea of the madness that was was ranging at that time. Um, yeah, so in that, in that next year, 1988, my rock olive funding wasn't renewed and I had, a, I had a year sort of treading water while I was applying for new funding. And so in that year, I, I put in a small grant application to the University of Western Sydney, who was supporting small projects, um, just in case I didn't get any further rock olive funding. Well, as it turned out, I got both, but by that time, um, by that time, the university had given me some money to start a pilot study. It wasn't very much. It was from uh, the $10,000, I spent $5,000 on a 125cc ag bike because that was the only way we were going to get into some of these places. And then I had $5,000 to employ a student uh, part-time to, to do some legwork. And uh, we did some interesting things. We first sent uh, questionnaires to all the people at Wedderburn. I think we sent out about 220 questionnaires and we got about 26 returned. Um, trying to find out just where they were on the, on, the, on the plateau. And then we did a whole lot of transects by which we walk in a straight line and we, we looked at all the grey gums on either side of the, this transect line. And we did these transects all over the shot. Um, and what we did, we, we basically verified the only other scientific work that had been done at the time, which was some work by CSIRO, who had made the assumption that wherever you find grey gums, the Eucalyptus punctata, that there also will you find koalas. And uh, they, they then plotted these grey gums and found that they didn't actually um, come into the, the development sites that they were going to build at Wedderburn, but they, they would have been affected by, by the development. Um, we virtually found this, the same sort of answer as they did, but as well as that, we, we found that where there were grey gums, you had a, a density of koalas at about one per 10 hectares. Now, to give you an idea of what that compares like with Victoria, there are some places down there where you'll get five animals per hectare. So you're looking at a 50-fold 50, 50 greater concentration of koalas in Victoria than you have in, that we had here at Wedderburn. Um, and uh, we did produce a little paper on this one. Oh, we're jumping ahead. Jumping to current. Anyway, um, this, is, this is quite an interesting little, little anecdote that turned up when I was um, going through this material. You all know Jeff McGill, the uh, now editor of the uh, MacArthur Advertiser. Well, when he was a, a young reporter, he, was, um, he came out with us on one of our first 
trips to, uh, to change the collar of her first animal, we'd put a radio collar on. And uh, in order to get expertise in, ko in handling koalas, I'd, I'd visited a number of different research um, groups that were working down the east coast of Australia. And so I'd, I'd had a little bit of a handle at, at, at uh, tackling koalas, but I really wasn't very good at it. And it just takes a lot of, a lot of time. And on this occasion, what you see on the, on the right, I'm actually hanging from a tree on a rope. Um, I must be about seven metres up at that stage, and Jeff's taken that photograph with a telephoto lens. And uh, every time, it was very embarrassing because I was hanging in the tree and every time that I would flag the koala down, he'd come down on the opposite side of the tree, as you can see him there. So if you've ever tried to handle a koala at the best of times um, and you try and do it with a trunk in the way, because no matter what, what you pull away, it just doesn't work. And so uh, this koala was shooting down the inside of the tree every time I'd bring him down and Jeff was getting... Uh, laughing harder and harder down below. And he could have actually scuttled the entire project if he had, if he had, had his, uh, if he had wanted to make a, a fool of me in the, in the press. But he was actually very kind. And uh, the, when you read the wording, it's, it, it is very kind to me. And so <laughs> we, went, we didn't have to jettison the whole project at the very early stages. Um, so I've got a lot to thank for Jeff in many ways uh, in that way. Um, but I... After the first transit worked, I realised that we had to get ear tags on animals. We just had to know how many animals we were looking at, and so we had to learn how to catch them. And we had to also put, get radio collars on uh, as much as we could. Um, the other thing that we had to find out was whether these animals were chlamydia prone. Um, a lot of the arguments had been that, um, that this was the only disease-free colony of koalas in the, in the, um, in the state. And so we had to find that, that out. So we, we made an arrangement with uh, Elizabeth MacArthur Ag Institute um, that they would investigate all our animals that we grabbed and, uh, and test them for chlamydia. And what they found was, for the test that were at that time, they found that there were antibodies to chlamydia, but there was no, uh, never any clinical signs. So what they thought was happening probably me, was that we had the bacteria in the, in the colony, but the animals were in good, good enough condition that they, they didn't actually activate these, um, uh, these chlamydia to, to produce clinical signs. So that's always been a bit of a worry um, that if our population does come under stress that we will see chlamydia come out. Um, now this, this map on the right hand side actually shows the the Wedderburn development and the O'Hare's Creek, which is the major creek bringing water down to the Georges River, is, is shown on the right. And that speckling is uh, where we'd, uh, from our transect work, we'd shown that there were koalas living. So you could see that if animals are to move from the O'Hare's Creek on the right to the Pheasant's, Nest, uh, Pheasant's Creek on the left, they probably would have worked, walked right through that. Uh, development site. So at that stage, having known that there were, was chlamydia in the population, that we thought, um, yes, it's quite possible that, that uh, they might be put under stress if they try to move from one point to another. Um, and that was, that I think was the first time we'd ever said anything of an environmental nature, that is of a, um, that's the first time we'd, we'd actually been confident enough to, to say anything about um, our studies in relation to the to the general environmental picture. And we produced a little paper from our first couple of uh, years' work with the Transex and the population densities. And this came out in the National Parks Journal with the first maps of, of sightings uh, on it. Then in, in uh, 1992, it was, I think, or thereabouts, um, We'd spent a bit of time walking in the Kendlin bush. We hadn't seen any koalas, but it looked just so good, this koala, uh, as a koala site, that I wrote a letter to the MacArthur Advertiser just in the general, edit, in the general let letters list, and I said, um, look, uh, people that are walking in the bush at Kendlin, uh, we believe there may be koalas out there. Could you keep an eye out for us? And the, the very next Sunday, I got a call from a bloke called Graham Groves, who turned out to be a, a brilliant amateur biologist. And he said, I think I've got what you're looking for. And 
we shot out there, and there of course was a, a Kyla and, and Kent Lynn, and that was the first, the first records, which was 92. And 93, we, um, we found this little one here, which was, um, uh, we, we named Shirley, and Shirley of course was the grand old matriarch of Kent Lynn, who's produced large numbers of offspring. She was only 18 months there when, when, when we caught her, or thereabouts, and she died, uh, it would be two years ago now, wouldn't it? Yeah, two years ago, at the age of about 13 or 14, and having uh, produced young probably for the last 10 years of her life. Um, the last two, unfortunately, died, but nevertheless, she vastly outnumbered herself. And she was living um, on the edge of George's River Road. We, we plotted her for, I think, about seven of the 10 years following. Her, she tossed her collar for a while, and we lost her for a little while. But uh, her area was amazing, because she would cross the George's River Road, and they were her neighbours. Uh, her, her, her boundary fence was their boundary fence. And actually there's two other dogs missing. Um, one of them was actually kept at night in a, in a cage in the, in, the, in the kitchen of the house that, the, that these dogs belonged to. So the owners could actually electronically open the gate if, if they heard somebody inside their house. It's quite amazing. But anyway, Shirley seemed to know that you don't go over that fence and yet her boundary and their boundary was shared for about 200 metres. Um, other things that um, koalas have to deal with is, um, is fire. And this was, I'm jumping a, a little about a bit here, but I'm, 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 I want to list the sort of things that our radio collared females had to deal with. And this is the site where uh, Francesca was living at, um, at Wedderburn after the 2001 fires came through. As you can see, it was, it was a fierce fire. I was watching it from the roof of my house at Wedderburn, and you could see fireball shooting up from, uh, from Wedderburn at that time. And yet, it, the animals survived. In fact, all our animals survived, except perhaps one whose radio collar went, on, went, on, went missing about two weeks before the fire. So they've been remarkably resilient. Um, and uh, while we're talking about fires, I, I got a call during the, um, uh, a couple of days after the fire to say that there was a, a burnt animal up one of the trees. So I went out to have a look and it was quite pitiful. The ears had been burnt off and there was, there was clearly um, swelling around the face and the legs. And I'd actually climbed the tree before I, um, and actually touched it before I realised that what I was looking at was a stuffed wombat that some joker had put up the, in the tree. And uh, it's interesting, it was just across the road from our, our friend and who, uh, from the, that I mentioned at the, at the start of the, of the lecture. But it, was, <laughs> it does show at least he's got a sense of humour. Um, and that, that, that corner is now known as Wombat Corner ever since. Now, we weren't the only people who have done koala studies in Campbelltown. The Australian Koala Foundation who, are, who have mapped the entire east coast of Australia according to the, uh, the quality of, of browse and koala habitat, um, produced a, a, a map, a koala map for Campbelltown Council. And uh, this is Steve Phillips. Um, he's a, a good koala man, but he, he does tend to get exaggerated a little bit at times, I think. Um, and they also produced the koala plan of management, which is still a draft koala plan of management. Uh, you can see 1998 was when it was handed in. It still promises to be, uh, to be taken up again. So we're, we're waiting to see what happens with that koala plan, plan of management. Uh, this is a paper that's, that Steve Phillips and John Culligan from the AKF actually wrote about the, um, uh, the Campbelltown koalas. And the way they based their activity, or they, they based their assumption that a, a tree was a, a food tree or was a valuable tree was by the number of koala pellets that you would find underneath each tree. And, uh, which is fine, I think it works to some extent, but we, we were finding that a lot of our koalas were living in turpentines, which, which is a, a tree that belongs to the same family as eucalypt, but it's, it's quite different. And Phillips and Callaghan haven't mentioned this tree at all as, as being uh, desired by koalas in the sense that, that they found koala pellets underneath. Um, so we were very interested in this. 
because at that stage there was a sort of a dogma amongst uh, koala workers that the tree that you find an animal in the morning is the one that it fed on the previous night. And uh, so we were finding them in the, in the turpentine trees, which meant, if the dogma was right, that they were feeding on the turpentine. And uh, I'll talk a little bit later about how we investigated that problem. But it did make us wonder a bit about the AKF data. Um, the AKF, ten, as I said, they tend to exaggerate a little. And, and when you look at the numbers of animals, this is 94 that they did this. So they're estimating only 60 at Wedderburn. Um, well, that's about the number we were, we were anticipating at, at, at 94, so we won't, con we won't contest that. Um, but at Mittagong, the numbers are building up fairly well. We're, we're getting quite a, lot of quite a lot of reports from the Mittagong area, Avon Dam area, and the southern parts. Um, the northern Blue Mountains up around Currajong, um, uh, Bilpin, we're getting a lot of reports over there as well. In Karingai Chase, where they said few remain, nobody, nobody's really looked. Um, the last I heard, which was about 1990, the rangers thought there were 30, but there's been nobody looking, looking for those koalas in, in 20 years. And uh, Blue Mountains, um, we've had a couple of animals sighted, no females as yet. But anyway, um, in 94, AKF reckoned there was 100 koalas in Sydney. Now that number now is very, very different. We'd be looking at least at uh, two to three hundred at Wedderburn, um, probably the same numbers up at uh, up at Colo Heights and, uh, and and Bilpin. We're looking at probably um, hundreds, uh, a couple of hundreds, I would think, at least in the Avon Mittagong area and further south. So uh, since 1994, things are, have been looking fairly good. I think they were probably better than than AKF thought. In '94, but I think they're probably a lot better than that now. Um, it had become pretty clear to us that um, that we needed to have a full-time person working on the on the koalas. Um, our money from the university had long since run out. Um, NPA had given us three and a half thousand dollars. Great had given us a thousand dollars, and there were various other donations. But it wasn't enough to maintain a, a whole project. So. Um, the MacArthur advertiser rang me up one day and they said, look, our parent body Fairfax has got um, $15,000 in a special fund that people have just sent in whenever we've written stories about koalas. Would you like to do something with it? And so I said, yes, please. And I said, um, if, if, I, if I speak to my, my bosses, maybe we can make a, a PhD scholarship up out of it, which we did. And um, I elected... Well, I, I, interviewed uh, a few potential uh, PhD students and Steve, I thought, was the, the best of the group. Although I didn't realise when I selected him that he was um, not very good at heights. I mean, he's a big fella, 104 kilos and 6 feet 4. I could understand that he wouldn't want to ride the 125cc ag bike. Um, but he did send me up the trees, I'm afraid. Um, but it, it was great to have somebody working full time and uh, um, Steve brought in a lot of good things. He got our previous paper data set onto a, com a proper computer system. Um, he worked out completely our community contact system with uh, the pager. And the pager has been running, I think, now since 96 or 7. And just a word on it, you've probably all seen the pager number on the, um, on the, uh, on the bottom of the column that, that we write every week. And uh, that's been ringing in now for over well, over 10 years. And we've, last report I counted, we had something like 2,500 community sightings, um, many of which have come in on the, on, the, on the pager. And I must just publicly acknowledge my wife at this point because living with a pager for 10 years um, is not that easy. And uh, of course the, the page will often go when you're sitting down to lunch or you're on your way to the beach or there's, um, there's, there's one, uh, one particular one she, she was found it very difficult for, and I'll just find my notes because I've got to get this right. Um, oh, no. Where is it? I'm just finding my notes because it is important I get this right. <laughs> Can't think where it is. Anyway, the, the gist of it was... 
we were, we were going to see... Um, and I've got to get the... There's a quotation involved here. This is going to be my big, my big joke. <laughs> now I've lost it. What have I done with it? Anyway, we'll come to it. Um, Now I just have to misquote Othello. <laughs> anyway, um, second act of Othello. Everything's dark and tense. My buzzer rings. And Othello says, silence that bell. <laughs> yes, anyway, the real, the real Othello. Okay, now I've completely missed my place up. My joke went down like a lead balloon. <laughs> and let's proceed. Um, yeah, so uh, as part of the deal with AKF to give us this money, we, um, we wrote, started writing a little column. Now, this is the very first one. It was down in about quarter font, so you could hardly see it, and I've blown it up there so you can read it. And uh, um, slowly, slowly they, it, it got bigger and bigger, and they, they eventually gave us a byline for it. Um, and this is Steve actually... You can see we used, from the very start, we've used the MacArthur Advertiser to get information. When animals are only at one animal per hectare, sorry, per 10 hectares, it's very hard to find them if you go out in the bush. And so we realised very early on that you would have to rely on the community to do the, the spotting for us. So that's the second column, um, and it, it, it really asks the community to, to look out for us. Incidentally, the little animal that um, Stephen is holding there... Um, when, it was, when we picked it up, we couldn't see what had killed it. And uh, it was only when we took the skin off that we could see that there were, were small teeth marks all through the, the, the back of the, the neck and the, and the skull. And it would have been, I think, probably a cat or a very small dog that had, that had killed this animal. And we never would have known unless we'd taken the skin off. So now we, we, we collect all the skulls and we look at all the, um, uh, the bruising, I guess, before we work out why an animal has died. This is another one. You can see it's a bigger animal. It's still a, a juvenile, but it's got a hole in the, in the skull. And again, on this animal, we, we picked it up beside the road pardon me, at, at Kentlin, and we had classified it as a roadkill until we took the skin off, because the skin is so elastic that the teeth can actually push through and, and, and damage the tissue underneath without breaking the skin itself. And... Uh, we now have an enormous skull collection of, of animals that we've, we've collected over the years and it'll be a marvellous teaching resource or research resource for many years to come. It's amazing how many animals that, have, that are killed on the road have got severe teeth and jaw problems. Um, in fact, I just exhumed one today that, uh, that had come from Bilpin and, and it lost the entire bottom um, diprotodont teeth. Um, yeah, so... Being a wild animal, particularly a koala at times, can be a very painful experience. This is the first one now. We're looking at February 21st, 1996. This is the first Max Koala Club that actually got a title for it. Um, and uh, we've been going ever since pretty well every, every week. Um, at this point now, we're, we're, we're developing quite a lot of information and we're feeling confident enough that we can make pronouncements on, uh, on things. This was the, the rezoning of Wedderburn. So we'd had enough data on, on kills and sightings and whatever to say that if you put another 500 people into Wedderburn, you're going to increase the pressure on, on koalas. That's, I mean, it's pretty basic and we're not saying very much, but at least we are now beginning to, to um, communicate our results back to the community. And then, of course, came the Holsworthy um, uh, Airport, and we were able to we were able to uh, make a contribution here because you can see now that we're we, all those little sightings are, are, are recorded sightings sent to us, and you can see where those uh, those airstrips were going to be put if they if they were really dinking about it in the first place. But uh, we got a lot of publicity there, even getting on to um, National Geographic. Um, that, that comes out of the National Geographic, November 97. And we also got a, quite a big article on USA Today, which generated a lot of pressure. It gave um, uh, Howard's contact details, and a lot of people actually wrote from US to try and stop that development. 
And um, we're also beginning to realise from Steve's work that where we're finding koalas is on what is called the, the shale soils. Now, the shale soils are those darker blue sections that you can see. Can, can, can you all work out where you are? We've got, uh, you've got Appen down the bottom, Wedderburn there on the, just below middle on the left, St Helens Park, Campbelltown, Kentland. So as you can see, the, as you follow the Georges River um, up, you can see that you've got the shale soils on the left and not very much of it out on the Holsworthy Range. So what this is, what this is in indicating is that um, the koalas are associated, very strongly associated with the shale soils and it's also that area between the, the river and the, the settlement of Campbelltown that is the greatest risk of losing animals. Um, Many of you may have seen in the MacArthur Advertiser last week the, the big headlines, Invasion of Koalas, um, which gave the idea that they, were, that they were safe. They're doing well and they're breeding well and they're spreading widely, but they're not safe. Wherever where the bush of those, um, those shale soils are endangered, then um, the koalas are endangered as well. Um, our first publication was um, basically just describing community uh, liaison and how we linked up with the community and fed back information. Now this rather beautiful uh, picture stems back to the question I'd raised earlier about the, the turpentines. We wanted to know whether koalas were, were eating turpentines. So we, um, what we did was to look at the, the cuticles of the leaves. Now this is a uh, a cuticle taken from a grey gum, Eucalyptus punctata. And what it is, it's the waxy transparent layer that overlies the, the leaf and stops it from losing water. And those little eyes that you see looking at you are the stomates or the little holes through which um, gases move. And as you can see, it's quite an amazing pattern. This is a stringy bark, um, Eucalyptus agglomerata. And again, if you look carefully, you can see there's differences in the size of those stomates and the cells, the pattern of the cells lining the cells, lining those stomates. And when you look at um, turpentine, of course, it's a quite a different thing completely. And we've never found turpentine in the um, uh, in any kind of fecal pellets. Yes, so clearly the way you the way you work work it out is you take the fecal pellets from the koalas, uh, you grind it up and you separate out those, the, the cuticle layer, stain it up, and then compare the patterns to see what they're eating. Yeah, so um, it was qu quite interesting to show that uh, koalas were using specific trees for, obviously, for shelter. And that was worth a, another little paper as well, which is, which is cited regularly now whenever koala browse is, is mentioned. Then we had a... Um, another environmental challenge where we did make a difference. This was St Helens Park. Uh, you may be aware of the, of the site that's um, where the land com owned previously and uh, they put a development application in and the, the council fought it and I was um, taken on as an expert witness to, to, to uh, argue for the council. We didn't have much information at that time only a couple of only a, uh, data from a couple of animals, but we were able to, to talk logically to the um, to the court land and environment court about the the threats if that uh, if that area at St Helens Park was developed, and uh, the judge decided in our favour, which was which was good, and he actually said that he liked our koala evidence better than the opposition's koala evidence. So that was a bit of a, a bit chuffed about that. Um, and then we come to, um, well, Steve finally got his thesis in in 2002 and we published some of the findings from that. Not all of it, there's an awful lot more yet to be published, but what he, we have published is his data that he's done on the importance of the shale soils. And this is the only table that, that I'm going to present for you, but it's quite an important one. Um, these are the different types of soil types. Now, wherever you see shale, and um, that's where we reckon is, is good. Um, so it gives you the area on the first column. The second column tells you the amount of, of cover. So when we look at that, that top layer, layer, the shale sandstone transition forest, 
Um, 58% of that forest has got less than 10% cover. That means it's fairly sparse, which means that it, a lot of it's been cleared. Um, the same thing goes with the shale sandstone transition forest. 76, sorry, 77% has got less than 10% cover. So that's pretty well cleared. Um, the next result is the number of koala sightings. So 51 for the shale sandstone. The RE value says is uh, measures the the I guess the, the density of that particular um, uh, no, it's, it's, the, it's the use. If you've got a very popular bit of, of, of soil, or that is, if you're finding animals on a small bit of soil, lots of animals, it means that a lot of them are choosing a small section of, the, of what's available. So their RE value would be very high. If you've got a lot of, a lot of soil and not many sightings on it, your RE value would be very low. So what it's saying is that that top, that top level, the, sand, the transition forest, is chosen, is sought out, if you like, by koalas. Okay, and that is, and there's only 1,300 hectares of that compared to the other. So what this is telling us is it gives us a priority, if you like, of um, soil types that we must preserve and the vegetation on those soil types, which is a major finding from his work. And this also comes from uh, Steve's thesis work. The yellow dots are sightings in the, in the uh, 91 to 95, and the blue triangles are 96 to 2000. So you can see, you can pick out there clearly the, uh, the high numbers of yellows and blues there, which is the Campbelltown population. And you can see the number of sightings further south. Okay, so what we've got, I think, is a, a, a healthy population at Campbelltown, but vulnerable um, to development. And the St Helens Park is going to come rise again any time now. And uh, this is going to be a big, for, big fight, but we've got a lot more data. We've got many animals' information now relating to that site. Um, so our, our arguments are going to be a lot stronger. But it is interesting to see that further south you do have a lot of sightings. And uh, I think there's no reason why those colonies shouldn't be expanding as, as much as our Campbelltown ones are. So just to finish, this is a this is a little cutting that I've had on stuck on my wall for for many many years now, and what it says is that in a particular suburb of Sydney, they they had um, <coughs> pardon me areas within that suburb you had high levels of child abuse, and other areas in the same suburb with similar um, ec economic um, background and so forth, you had lower levels of child abuse. And the, the, only, other, the, the only difference that the, the researcher could find was that the, the, the area, those little hot spots of, of abuse were the people who lived there weren't proud of the, where they lived. They didn't enjoy living where they were. And in the low areas, the, the low abuse areas, they did enjoy living where they were. Now there are so many parts of, of Campbelltown which are a less than 10 minutes cycle ride to the river and the bushland, that I think we've got a fantastic resource that's available. Um, and so I, I think really our value over the last 20 years has been to, to persuade people that we have got a resource that needs to be looked after. It's not just the koalas, but the koalas, as you can see from the, down the years, they've raised publicity levels and they've been able to, we've been able to do things that you never would have been able to do on the strength of the, the long-nosed bandicoot or the brown antichinus or the um, uh, even, even the brush-tailed rock wallaby. The koala has got that, that ability to, 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 I guess, communicate. And I think that's really where, where our great value has, has, has been is in, with our, um, the columns with the publicity we've got, we've been able to always raise this, this, the value of the bushland. And uh, while we're just on that, I've still got some of the old, old videos that we've, we've produced. If anybody wants to take one home, give them to a local school or anybody that uh, you're very welcome to take one of those away for me. Thank you.
Rob Price. Yeah. That was lovely. That was very interesting. Mm. A bit like a walk through time. I can remember those. Hang on. Those fighting days back there when Yap Yan Pin wanted to build out at Wedderburn. We didn't want the development to go ahead. And uh, there were a few big placards and some loud raised voices and. Hmm. All very civilised. Mm. And we won. Some questions? Sure. Some questions for Rob. Oh, Rob. Yes. By the uh, way, these two fellows often get mistaken in Campbelltown. They're both <laughs> Robs and they're both bearded. Uh, uh, very. Going back to your last picture there where you were showing the population uh, spotted on the. You yep. showing the high density up around Campbelltown. Yep. Oh, I, almost certainly, yes. So there's hopes that there could be a fairly high population mm. further yeah. south. Yeah, yeah. And that uh, more people looking might find more. Problems. Sure. Yeah, sure, certainly. Certainly, yeah. Roland. Yes, uh, Steve was able to show that um, that koalas living on the shale areas were bigger and had a, a greater fertility rate than the, the animals living on the sandstone. And it yeah. would be also true that the more fertile shale soil is what human beings want to clear for gardens. Exactly, yes, yes, certainly. I, I mean, most of it was cleared early on for farming. Yes. 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 Any other questions there? Yes. Rob, Julie. could you fill us in just very briefly about your translocation program to Tawa? Sure. Um, two years ago, October, 20, October 2006, we took a, um, a young pair of koalas from Campbelltown down to Tala River National Park where a, a land care group was replanting large areas and corridors with food trees in the, in the hope that they would, um, they would encourage koalas to come. And we put two radio collared animals down there. Um, after six weeks, unfortunately, the, the female's collar ceased to, 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 to transmit. We knew it was still functioning because it, it made a loud squeal, squealing sound just before it gave up the ghost. And we've never been able to find the female since. We've tracked a male, and the male's had very curious movements. Um, he'll, he'll foray, he'll do little excursions from a, a central point, which he stays over winter, and then spring comes and he moves. The first, the first year he just moved four kilometres, and then he set up again for the next winter. And then uh, he moved, he's recently moved 12 kilometres, uh, north from his release site and uh, he's just started to move again after over, overwintering. So what we want to do is we want to take another young female down with a radio collar on to, to settle out the problem um, and, uh, and just see how they, how they, they fit in. I'm, I'm sure the female's still there but it's just such a huge area and if it's hard finding an animal in 10 hectares, if you try and find an animal in 15,000 hectares, you know, it becomes, becomes very, very tricky. And we're just hoping that the young male will lead us back to him. And have, have you seen any indication of koalas that were already down there? No, not since, not since that very first day. That, that the day after the, the transmitter broke on the female, an animal was seen, which, which two of the people on the ground there swore was a different animal. So we assumed it was a, another male. But we've seen hide and a hair of neither the original female nor this mystery mail since that night. So it's a, it's a bit of a quandary. Yeah. Yes? Rob, is the MacArthur colony either infected or under threat from the retrovirus? Good, good question. Good question. Um, and oh, look, I forgot to mention this was part of the, the 
ongoing project is that, that Tristan Lee is, um, is now looking at the DNA samples that we've collected over the years, which must be what? We've got 120, Tristan? About 200. 200. Okay, so we've got 200 samples of, of tissue which Tristan is looking at the DNA for, and he's going to knock the rest of this data into shape too, we hope. Um, but uh, from the DNA, we, I was just talking to David Fayman, his uh, uh, supervisor from Sydney, um, that we may be able to detect the retrovirus from the DNA that, that, he'll, that Tristan will be running for genetic purposes. And that would be fascinating if we could do that. Um, we did have an animal sent to us last year that the local vet thought might have been retrovirus, but I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what, if he knew what the symptoms were precisely. Yeah. No, good question. So do you think they were using them for experimental purposes? Yeah. Interesting. Well, it certainly would be interesting. I mean, they may, whether they let their doors open at the end of the uh, end of the, the experimental session would, could really confuse things, couldn't it? Mm. Yeah. If you hear any more about that, I'd be anxious to hear hear from you. Um, yes, yes, we've had a female at Long Point. We've had young males um, going into the army barracks there at, um, at uh, what's the name of that street? Wendy, where you did your famous catch? Moorbank, Moorbank, Moorbank Avenue. Yeah, so young males are going right down, heading into Liverpool. But the furthest north we've had a female is, is uh, Long Point. But there's no reason... There's no reason why they shouldn't go all the way to Liverpool. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> yeah, Peter Meadows is a really popular spot. Um, yeah, we've got uh, a number of animals living permanently down there, and and we've had sightings of many others as well. Seems very good. Quite a few live birds there too. Is there? Well, I guess um, from the from the testing we, we did originally at EMAI, they 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 said there was chlamydia in the animals, but they'd never increased to the point where they'd caused clinical signs to occur. So presumably in Kangaroo Island, there must have been no um, residual uh, uh, chlamydia in the animals. I presume because that, that sort of population pressure you would think would have brought the chlamydia on. Yes, they were. Yeah. yeah, 28 animals came from one of the Victorian islands. Let me see. Yeah. Yeah, one. Yep. Yes. Um, well, down in, down in Avon, they, they feed on sea bari. Which we don't we don't see very much of at Campbelltown. Um, it's interesting the, um, the the ones we've translocated down to Tarlo, or the, the male has has stuck mainly to the punctata and the stringy barks, even though he's had famous koala trees like Viminalis down there to feed on. He's never been seen in, in any of those, so he's um, he's sticking to his familiar feed, and yet. Um, we caught an animal on. When did we catch Charlotte? Was that uh, was 
Suddenly. Anyway, she was in a, a, a Nikolai, which was a, um, a tree that's been brought in as a sort of a garden tree. And uh, they love that. Yeah. Well, I have something for you now, Robert. I'd like to say in thank you very much for your presentation. And I'd like to say how very helpful Rob has been. Um, it's been a close association between Rob Close and the local National Parks Association. We've appreciated your input. We've always appreciated your assistance with such things as this. And we're very, very pleased whenever we can contribute towards your ongoing research. And so we wonder if tonight you'd like to accept for the next five years, honorary membership of the National Parks Association, please. Oh, certainly. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you yes. much. So I'll just a little more information for you. Tonight is number three in our lecture series. Um, in November, on the 19th, Michael Paul, a local ornitho ornithologist, will be along to speak on birds. And I hope you may be able to come along on that evening as well. Uh, Michael is a very, very experienced birdo, and I'm sure he'll have some interesting things to say to us. I will also add that on the 25th of October, um, see, we get the use of this wonderful auditorium because we are working in cooperation with the Arts Centre. And so the NPA is running a series of art walks with, for, for people who, they're, um, they're like workshops. And, and what happens is that we set up a bushwalk, the artists come along, they provide, they do their painting and their photographing and whatever, and we simply, as members of the NPA, take them on the bushwalk, ensure that they get there safely and come back safely. And it's a collaboration. It's worked very well in the past. We will continue to do that, and so that's how we can build our collaboration with the Arts Centre. Um, we have our next Arts Walk coming up on the 25th of October, and those who wish to come along, very welcome. Uh, you just need to give me a call and let me know, um, and it will be, uh, I think we're meeting about 9 o'clock here in the parking area, but just so we can have an idea of the numbers. We'll be going somewhere fairly local where there are plenty of opportunities for photography, painting, sculpture. Koala spotting. Koala spotting. <laughs> it goes without saying. <laughs> so I think I've covered all the points I need to cover. Um, this lecture series is presented by the National Parks Association in conjunction with the University of Western Sydney and the Arts Centre. And uh, we would like to invite you to come and join us now for a cup of tea outside. Yep. And thanks once again, Good. Rob. Well, can I ask you next week? <laughs> I'll see how we go. I think I'd like to make it a recurrent theme. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, pleasure.